Women Taking the Lead, episode 108. You need to think about yourself as a company. And what are your assets? What does your company produce? What's the value of your company? And what do you bring to the table? And how do I need to grow my assets? And your assets being your skills, you know, and it could be personal or professional development because I think one impacts the other. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentl.com forward slash recognize to reserve your spot in our upcoming webinar on how to be recognized and rewarded for the work you do. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hey everyone, I have something special for you this time because this episode represents our one year anniversary for women taking the lead. Woohoo! We made it one year. I am so excited and I'm so glad you're here to celebrate it with me. And for this episode, I reached out to a woman who is very special in my life. She was the first female mentor I ever had. She was my boss for several years. She's become a friend and continues to be a mentor. And her name is Veronica Seaman. And I refer to her as Ronnie. So from here on out, you're going to hear her as Ronnie. But we used to joke that there were two sides of her. There was Veronica, who you didn't mess with. And there was Ronnie, who was the good friend. Um, So Ronnie currently is the Vice President for Columbia Management Investment Services Corp. And that's the transfer agent for the Columbia Funds. She oversees the client services group to ensure the delivery of superior customer service while maintaining standards and requirements as established by the company in various regulatory agencies. She's had a 28-year career and has overseen many areas of organizations, and her last assignment was Vice President of Shareholder Services, Quality Assurance, and Corporate Training. She's led the Seligman Call Center and Transaction Action Processing Divisions to receive 11 Dalbar Mutual Fund Service Awards and nine Intermediary Service Awards from 1995 to 2008. Additionally, her team achieved the National Quality Review's five-star designation for overall transaction processing for 22 consecutive quarters from 2003 to 2009. She studied at the College of Staten Island with a concentration in business management, and she's earned Six Sigma Green Belt at the University of Southern Maine, and she holds a Series 6 and 26 NASD securities license. My goodness, she's qualified. We get it. (laughs) So without further ado, I'm going to take you into my interview done by Ronnie Seaman. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Jody Flynn. After a successful career in mutual fund operations as the Assistant Vice President of Corporate Quality, Jody set off on a new adventure and founded her coaching business. Her specialty is partnering with women who experience self-doubt and overwhelm to overcome stress, get organized, and start creating the business and the lifestyle they dreamed of having. Her podcast, Women Taking the Lead, inspires women from humble beginnings to overcome self-doubt and lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. The podcast has hit number one in three categories of iTunes, new and noteworthy, business, careers, and society and culture. It is a privilege both professionally and personally to be here with her to mark the one-year anniversary of the launch of Women Taking the Lead podcast. Oh, Ronnie, thank you so much. (laughs) It's an honor to have you interview me for this episode because you mean so much to me. And for those listening, thank you so much for joining Ronnie and I, to have this conversation one year in to the podcast. It's so crazy. Wow. Wow. It is quite an accomplishment. So that's just a little intro. So let's get started. Jody. why don't you tell us more about you and your humble beginnings? Okay. So the background story for anyone who hasn't heard my intro episode, it's worth going back, but I was born and raised in Worcester, Massachusetts. My dad was a tradesman. He's retired now, but he was a plumber for the city of Worcester School Department, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. 
I have seven brothers and sisters. There are four boys and four girls. And we were all born within 10 and a half years. So we're all really close in age. Um, but, you know, we didn't have money growing up, but we were raised with a lot of love and very clear values of God, family, and education. And those values were reflected in every part of my childhood. And I would say, I was very smart growing up, but I had probably more than I had in smarts, I had in self-doubt of myself. Um, I know I held myself back, especially when I hit the sixth grade, because doing well and getting good grades brought negative attention from my schoolmates. So I tried to hide it and purposely not do well. Um, And I wanted to avoid negative attention at all costs because I was too shy to handle it. Um, And negative attention from my peers was worse than negative attention from my parents and my teachers. Unfortunately, that's just the way it went. Um, But pretty soon I started uh, to believe I wasn't as smart as my teachers or my parents believed me to be. And luckily, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a teacher that believed in me so much that I started to see what she saw in me and I started to apply myself again. And at the end of my junior year, she wrote a letter of recommendation for me to be in the first AP psychology course offered in the U.S. And that was the beginning for me. I can see how that class um, directly impacted the course my life took from then on. And I have my bachelor's in psychology. I did postgraduate work in counseling psychology, and I went on to work in mutual fund operations. And I did very well there. I was rapidly promoted, um, but started feeling the calling to do something different. And after back-to-back acquisitions, I made the leap into entrepreneurship and started my coaching business in 2010. And last year, on March 25th, I launched this podcast, and my life has been a whirlwind since then. <laughs> that, yeah, I would say so. I mean, not to, to steal the line from the movie, but you are quite the girl on fire, <laughs> yes. I would say. And it, it seems as though seeing yourself from someone else's perspective and, and through their lens is, is what started it for you, but it, it certainly, you didn't need them to see it as, as anyone who knows you would say Mm. as well, I think. But um, so you talked a little bit of some some of the successes in talking about your your growth in especially the mutual fund industry, which I can I can personally vouch for. But you've had various successes in your life and you've gained confidence along the way from those things. But I'm sure and I hear that in your story, there are times when you were playing small Mm. and you may not have been aware of it at the time. But now as, as you've gone through through your growth, you probably can see it more clearly. Would you share with us a story from there and the lessons you learned? Yeah. And, you know, as some of my prior guests have shared, like, they're like, man, I could share a whole bunch of stories, right? <laughs> because, you know, it's an interesting thing that as we evolve, as we suddenly realize how capable we are, we're still in a process of than playing small again, because I don't think we all realize how fully capable, like what we're fully capable of, like it's way more infinite, I think, than we believe. But I definitely have a really good story to showcase um, one point in my life. Mm -hmm. It was after I decided not to complete my master's in counseling psychology, I was looking for a job to help pay the bills while I figured out what my next move was going to be. And I remember looking through the want ads then, Mm. and there were a range of jobs, but there was a gap. Um, now keep in mind, it was the year 2000, so it was some time ago. Um, there were jobs with an annual salary of about 22 to 24,000. And then they jumped to about 30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe because I was, you know, my, um, schooling had been in psychology and these were more business based jobs. They were in offices. I didn't believe I could provide enough value to be worth $30,000 a year, and I was too intimidated to go after it. So I got a job processing new accounts for mutual funds that paid $23,000 a year. And what's really crazy is, you know, there 
we're going to get a little bit more into the whole story and I go into it um, in some of my blogs, but I accepted that job in the year 2000 for $23,000 a year because I didn't think I was worth more. And by the end of 2006, so by, you know, um, six years later, Mm -hmm. um, actually it was by the end of 2005 because you and I met in December of 2005 when you told me about my promotion to be assistant vice president, although it didn't go into effect until 2006. Mm -hmm. But that was my fifth promotion in those five and a half years. And I was earning a heck of a lot more than $23,000 a year, right? And what I learned is experience and technical skills are not the only measure of value. I was eager, when I started that job in the year 2000, I was eager to learn, I was determined to do well, and I developed other qualities that made me a prime candidate for those promotions. And I've applied that in my business as well. There are times I go into situations not sure if I'm the best candidate for the job, But sure enough, after some conversation and asking key questions, it becomes obvious that I'm the perfect coach, trainer, or facilitator for the situation. And that's what I've learned from that experience. How much or how how big a factor do you think motivation played in all that? Because to me, it sounds like while your your skill levels might have been lower, the motivation sounded really high. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, you know me, (laughs) (laughs) but to explain to everybody else, I'm, I'm pretty type A, you know, I like to do well. If my name is going on it, I want it to be a good finished project and behind the scenes, it might be like, (laughs) you know, something exploded in the kitchen sort of, you know, picture that that's might what be going on in the background. Mm -hmm. But when I when I'm delivering a finished product, I want it to be the best that it can be, right? Or that I can do at that time. You know, although I I'm a bit of a perfectionist, you know, so mistakes drive me crazy. I'm I'm willing to make mistakes if I if I can learn from them. Yeah, you know. And I was I you're right. I was definitely motivated, and it's not even like I had the goal to be promoted. My goal was to do my best. Yeah. And, and I think when you talked about going through various phases and, and not feeling the confidence, meanwhile, you had so much motivation and, and so much desire that mm-hmm. you, you didn't see that. Yeah, right. you're absolutely right. I can, you know, I can learn as I go. <laughs> <laughs> That sort of thing. I have a friend who got some advice and I laughed when she told me this because although I didn't have this advice, you know, um, in my like, quote unquote, growing up years, it's definitely how I've lived in my career. And the advice she got was the answer to how is yes. Ooh, that's pretty neat. Yeah. So when somebody, you know, says, you know, we'd like you to take this opportunity or we'd like you to have this um, role or be on this project and you're thinking to yourself, how am I going to do this? You know, the answer is yes. And you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's quite true. Yes. (laughs) So now you've shared your story and in how you were playing small. Does that in any way play into your your journey where you had a wake up call? along the way? Well, I was definitely while I was working in mutual funds, you know, we were going through our first acquisition. Oh, the memories. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was definitely a a turbulent time, right? And I think that period just had everyone kind of questioning, like, what is going on? You know, what's our goal here? What are we doing? And I was reading Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, at the time. Um, And the book begins by bringing you back to a time when the earth was covered in trees and plants, but there were no flowers, right? Because the environment at that time could not support a flower. And then one day, the first flower came into being, but as he says it, it couldn't have lasted long, right? Because it still was a pretty hostile environment, but it was enough where the flower could quickly bloom and then probably died. But another grew, 
and then another. And it may have taken hundreds or even thousands of years, but now we have whole landscapes covered in wildflowers. And Eckhart Tolle compared human consciousness to the evolution of the flower and stated that, you know, we're in a time where we as humans are experiencing a leap in consciousness, but just like the flower, the environment does not fully support it. But the more people who experience this awakening, the more suitable the environment will become for more and more people to have this shift in consciousness. And reading those few pages at the beginning of the book, I thought, oh my God, that's why I'm here. Like, it was like, I, like literally at that point, I felt like I did catch fire, Wow! right? Because I had so much energy that started coursing through my body as I read this. And that, that was the thought, like, like the, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm meant to do. I need to be a part of this and what's going on. And as you know, I had difficulty trying to articulate, <laughs> you know, what was going on for me and, you know, to, you know, for, to everyone around me at the time, I, I just didn't have the words to explain like the evolution of the flower and human consciousness and what I'm meant to be doing, you know, but everyone was, was very supportive and that's great. You know, if you're excited about this, <laughs> go for it. You know, um, I, I don't think anybody would get in your way once you have your mindset on something. <laughs> in general. So I, I think that's a pretty safe thing to say where, where everyone was like, okay, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Step aside. I know. I, I, I do rise to the occasion, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but it, it was it was one of those things. Like once I had that jolt of energy course through me, it was it was something I I couldn't ignore. And you guys are are very intuitive people too. The the people I had around me at that time, as you know, knew me well. You know, and and we're very intuitive people as well. And I think everyone just sensed like that. You know, something something was going on for me. You know, and around this time, I also started meeting professional coaches, and I was very curious about who they were and what they did and what made them so special in my eyes. Yeah. And I started researching coaching certifications. And so when the second acquisition came around and, you know, the final decisions were made, you know, I was I was ready to make my move. Like it was it was I remember the meeting you and I had in your office when, you know, you were delivering the news that, you know, our jobs were being outsourced and the changes that were coming. And I remember you you were crushed, you know, that this this was happening. Um you know, you were going to be going on to work for um, the new company and you were going to be setting up a, a new office. And I was so excited for you because I knew there, there wasn't anybody that they could have picked who was better than you at doing that. And I remember you were just devastated in delivering this news. And I remember being like, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this is great. You know, this is good for me. And, you know, it was, it was a moment because I, I knew you were, really wanted the best for me. Yeah. Well, you know, you don't have very many opportunities and interactions in your life, or, or unfortunately, you don't get very many where you work with groups of people and you can feel like a family and, mm -hmm. and, and people, you can feel the, the care and the, the, you can walk in the door and you can feel the culture in an environment and, yeah. and we were really, really fortunate to have that. And I think for us in a financial services group, when we had you coming around and saying, I think I'm interested in coaching. And we're all, I, I don't know what that means, but she's so <laughs> determined. I, I support you and yeah. she'll do well in anything she does. And the more we started to talk about what you were learning along the way in terms of, of what you needed to do to get where you wanted to be. Uh, the more you shared about that, you could see the transformation and you could see the excitement that you hadn't had any, any more for financial services. And you could mm -hmm. see, you could see the life in you really blooming to, to, to a, a flower of itself, if you will, to, to, to go back on your story. So I think it was, it was a, a good time in a lot of people's lives in, in many ways. I hear like when you talk about the various steps that you took, you, you researched why it was that 
you were interested in the coaching. Are, are there any other steps that you took along the way that you felt led to your success that you'd want to share? I would say, I mean, it was hard. I definitely took some risks. You know, I remember, you know, being in that financial services, you know, environment. And, you know, my my core group around me was very supportive, but I was also leading a team. Mm-hmm. And it felt a little risky for me um, as a manager because my my management style at that time was very, I just, I describe it to people as familial, you know, I felt very motherly. Mm-hmm. Um towards my team. I wanted to take care of them. I had high expectations for them, but I wanted to take care of them and I wanted them to know they they had my support. And it was very difficult on the one hand going through the acquisitions to support everyone through that because it was emotionally it was very turbulent, although I'm I'm so proud of how everyone, you know, pulled together and supported each other through that. But also transitioning into this next phase, it it felt very vulnerable to be sharing that, Mm -hmm. you know, because it did feel, even though I was very passionate about it, it also felt very personal. I was still trying to articulate it and trying to discover for myself, like, what exactly is this going to look like on the other side? I'm not exactly sure, you know, but I know this is, this is the path I need to be going down. So I think what has also led to my success is just allowing myself to take risks and being a little more vulnerable and a little more transparent, you know, especially as a business owner and needing to market my services, especially my services Mm -hmm. being coaching, you know, training and facilitating, like I have to put my story out there, you know, and share some of my own, you know, what in my past lives would have been like private moments that I would have only shared with my close friends. Yeah and gotten support from now I'm kind of letting the world know, (laughs) you know, like, Hey, I had a fight with my sister. (laughs) This is what it looked like. And this is what it went down. And this is what I learned from it. And here's what I want to pass on to you. So I think also what has, has led to my success too, is, is just allowing myself to take a few risks Hmm. as well. Like being willing to do it wrong or, or go a little too far and, you know, apologize when it's necessary and, and come back a few steps if I've, if I've overdone it. Wow. So I guess, I mean, what you, you really try to, to instill in folks through all of your podcasts is that there's no one way to lead. We're all different. We're all going to lead differently. So I guess, and, and you touched a little bit on it in talking about your, your former team, but how, Mm -hmm. how would you describe your leadership style? Yeah, like I was describing, there's definitely some duality in my leadership style. I am very nurturing, very supportive, and I naturally look for the strengths and the skills in others. And I'm, you know, I'm working to draw those out and get people to see them too, right? I, I definitely get a thrill in helping somebody realize like how capable they are and what talents they have that they're not appreciating. Um, and I'm also a leader with high expectations. You know, I, I'm very results oriented and I want to see results. And nowadays when I think about leading, I I think about my clients, not that I'm directing them, but applying some of those leadership skills to my clients. And my favorite clients are the action takers, Mm -hmm. you know, during our sessions, we're delving into areas where they're confused or intimidated and we get to a place where they then feel confident and clear on what needs to happen. And then they're off and they're getting it done. And more often than not, they come back and they're reporting in that not only did I do everything, but I've gotten all this other stuff done too. Right. And that, that I love to see it's inspiring. It's, it motivates me, um, and inspires me in my business as well. And, I think as a leader, it's incredibly gratifying to have someone on your team who pushes you to keep growing, you know, so I, I like that. I, and I, and back in the day, even being in financial services, I liked when my team members pushed me to be a better manager, a better leader, right? I remember times where, you know, some of my team members called me on the carpet, <laughs> on some things. Right. And it's, of course, like in the moment you're like, Oh, this is happening. (laughs) Like, I didn't see this. 
right, this is a, this is a little uncomfortable. They're calling me on my crap, yep. you know. And but you know what? Upon reflection, I'm like, God, thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, like I am going to be better, and I know people are watching, so that motivates. <laughs> That motivates me. It's having that accountability, that person who also has high expectations for me, I it then calls me to be better. Yep, yep. It makes you r- r- rise to the, the occasion or rise to the level of expectation, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So what's something you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, I right at the end of this month, although I want it to, it's going to be a continuous thing. I'm going to keep bringing it back because I think it, it's incredibly valuable. I'm doing a free webinar. It's called How to Be Recognized and Rewarded for the Work You Do. And as we've talked about in my own career, I have a history of being quickly promoted and being the person others are calling on to take on greater responsibility with greater rewards as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that it was because I was special or superhuman, right? There were just some things I caught on to quickly and was able to build them up, you know, as I accepted each promotion. I hear many women in my community and, you know, for those within organizations talking about not feeling appreciated at work or not having a great relationship with their boss or senior leaders. And for those women in the community who are self-employed, what I'm hearing is that it's not getting as much business or referrals as they feel like they should be getting. And so with this webinar, I want to address all of that. And I'm going to be giving some easy strategies that they can put in place that will cause those around them to notice them more, appreciate them more, and respect them more. And then, of course, compensate and hire them. Wow, that sounds like something a lot of folks could use. Yeah. Because, because it's true. It's um, People do wonder sometimes if it isn't because, oh, well, what did that that person do? that right. got them that job or got them that promotion. And and sometimes if you step back, which it sounds like you've done, and, and you look at what are those things that I did and, and you tie them to skills mm-hmm. and actions versus like the emotions of just, well, why not me? It, it sounds, that sounds really exciting. And it, it's, it sounds like something that would, will help not only other business owners, but women in any type of role. Yes, you know, and, um, you know, as we're talking, I can think back to the days when, you know, you'd be in a meeting with other managers or other leaders, and you're thinking about what's coming down the pipe, Mm -hmm. right? What what's their potential for somebody's going to get a promotion. So then their position is going to have to be filled. And then, you know, whoever moves out of into that role, well, their position is going to have to be filled. And you start looking around and thinking about, well, who could fill in some of these gaps, right? Or if somebody says, I'm going to be moving across the country, right? (laughs) So we're going to have to fill their position. Somebody's going to either get promoted or we're going to hire from the outside. Of course, the question, it then comes into question, who's ready, right? And who do we think of? Like, who can we trust Mm -hmm. to put into this role? Who, who's ready to step up, you know? And it became very clear to me, like what we were just intuitively looking for Mm -hmm. in people. And I think sometimes we, you know, when I say we, I mean like, you know, you know, just go into our jobs. We want to be promoted. We want opportunities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we get so stuck being on autopilot, you know, and not really thinking about the long game that, we're not thinking about, well, what do, what do my senior leaders want in a person? Mm -hmm. It's carving out some time too, isn't it? It's, it's looking at it's you, you go in and you do your work. As you said, you're, you're, you're doing what you need to do, but carving out the time to look at and say, well, what do I do for me? What do Mm -hmm. I do to improve what I have to offer? How, how do I, I engage? Yeah. 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 It's very, very true. I think, I think we're giving away your webinar a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> no, there's tons, there's tons more than this. Yeah, but no, you're absolutely right. You're, po- you're pointing exactly in the right direction. I remember reading an article, I wish I could remember the magazine, it was a long time ago. But it said, you, you need to think about yourself as a company. Yeah. Right. And what are your assets? What does your company produce? What is what is your what, what's the value 
of your company and what do you bring to the table? And that really had me thinking about, yeah, what do I bring to the table and how do I need to grow my assets and your assets being your skills, mm. you know, and it could be personal or professional development. Cause I think one impacts the other, yeah. um, Absolutely. you know, working at, you know, who's the person I want to grow into. Yeah. And I think just people don't take that time for themselves to think about that. It's because mm-hmm. you're, you're always busy doing and so I think it's really awesome to, to, to take the time and get folks to do that and, and think about and, and do that inventory. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It is. It really. And it doesn't have to take long either. Mm-hmm. You know, once you catch on to the areas you need to grow personally in, it's a pretty rapid process once you commit to it. Good. So you're going to wrap that up for everybody real quick. <laughs> real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. So, all right. Now I, I need to do a, a quick leadership roundup here just mm-hmm. to, to get us more focused again on our, our interview yes. versus our conversation. Um, so why don't you tell us what is one practice that you have that helps make you a better leader? I pay attention to the vibe in the room, right? And I think this is something I picked up from you watching <laughs> you when you used to be in meetings, you were really good at this. Like when, when a meeting's going on, you know, and it doesn't have to be at work. It's also like when you're gathering with friends at a restaurant or a party or something like that, you know, I'm watching people's facial expressions. I'm listening for tone of voice and word choice, how they're sitting and all of that. And it's not to make assumptions. It's to look for opportunities to connect with people, right? Either to acknowledge you know, something special that I noticed or to check in and see if they need my support. Mm -hmm. So paying attention is something I'm always practicing and trying to get better at. Nice. Okay. How about, uh, what's a book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop leadership? There are so many, but I, I'm going to focus in on this one. Somebody else brought it up before, but I, I think it bears repeating. It's The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And what I love about this book is it addresses a huge challenge in that we can easily get overwhelmed with all it's going to take to get where we want to be. Hmm. And what Jeff puts forth in his book is to identify the simple things we can do to move toward our goal. He describes them as the things that are so easy to do, they're just as easy not to do, right? Like kissing our partner hello or or goodbye, adding a vegetable to a meal, taking the stairs, spending 15 minutes reading a book, you know, et cetera, on and on. All these little simple things we can do that move us in the direction, but by doing something easy every day in the area we want to grow in, we gain that slight edge and it accumulates over time. And before we know it, we've completely transformed that area of our life. So the slight edge by Jeff Olson. Oh, cool. Adding that to my Kindle. Oh, you'll love yeah, it. That sounds really neat. And here, here's a good question for you after like some of the things we've talked about. What advice would you give your younger self? Mm. Don't lose faith. Worry and despair are symptoms that you are trying to control things that you have no control over. Set your goals, do your best, find enjoyment, and trust that God is taking care of the rest. Wow. Wow. Maybe I can, I can play that recording for some younger selves that I know <laughs> and, and tell them, listen to this. It's, it's, it's funny, huh? When, when you think yeah. about telling your younger self something, I wonder if we would have listened. You know, I thought about that too. I'm like, my parents probably told me this, but I don't remember. <laughs> Cause I probably said to myself, what do they know? What do they know? Right. Exactly. But it's, it's good to repeat these things. Cause I was thinking too, I would probably keep telling myself this today. Yeah. 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 So with that in mind, do you have a, a success quote or a mantra that, that you use for yourself? And if you do, what, what is the meaning for you? Mm, I love this quote. There's a couple that have this flavor that are very meaningful to me. And it's life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And that's by Ananise Neen. Wow. I really like that. I love that. That is really cool. It kind of gave me shivers. 
Yes. Well, it also, I'll, I'm going to throw another one in there because, because it's my podcast and I can, but <laughs> um, the other one. See, see, she is pushy. She's bossy. I, <laughs> very pushy and bossy. It's true, but it's a good one. You got to hear yep. it. Um, it's by Helen Keller. And it, it, this again, uh-huh. this quote has been on the show before, but I love it. It's um, life is a daring adventure or nothing. Wow. Well, wow. that sums you up in, in very many ways. Knowing you for as long as I do, both professionally and personally, that, that really, they both sum you up really well. Yeah, thank they you. They really do. Um, kind of a, a funny question for you, Madam Podcaster, but what's the best way for this community to connect with you? Mm, <laughs> well, You can, of course, uh, find me at womentakingthelead.com, and there are social media buttons at the top of the page, and connect with me wherever you feel most at home. I love it when people reach out to me, and I'm very open to feedback. Okay, and I think they can find links and resources shared from our episode at womentakingthelead.com as well. Yes. Yes, they can. If you put Jody in the search bar, my episodes will come right up. Awesome. Either that or all of them will come up, but I'm hoping it'll take you right to the ones <laughs> where I'm specifically on. Excellent. <laughs> As a guest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And I would just like to share that Jody takes pride in walking her talk and taking on challenges that push her outside of her own comfort zone, if you haven't already noticed. But it's from running a marathon to following her passion for a career that moved her away from her family and friends to a new state in some of what we've talked about. Certainly in launching Women Taking the Lead podcast, Jody feels the same fears others do when putting herself out there, but she knows that the path to living full out and loves to encourage others to overcome their fears and do the same. So in celebration of the one-year anniversary of launching Women Taking the Lead podcast, on behalf of your listeners, friends, and colleagues, Jody, of which I am so proud to be among, thank you, Jody Flynn, for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us to lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. We are all better for having met you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. That was wonderful. It's from the heart, my friend. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life? Head over to womentl.com forward slash recognized to reserve your spot in my upcoming webinar on how to be recognized and rewarded for the work that you do. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me, and here's...